must walk through snow and ice in order to get to school and return to a chilly and bitter cold home. Imam Hussein Development and Relief Foundation are determined to help. We will be providing households with coal to burn throughout the winter. $150 is all we need. $150 will be enough to provide heat and warmth for one household for the whole winter. That's $150 for four months. You can donate via PayPal, bank transfer or visit us at www.ihdrf.org to make a donation. Help us to spread warmth. Thank you. The tragedy of Fatima to Zahra was that her and her husband's rights were taken away. Fadek and even Khaybar is not a historical event we should just look at. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his holy progeny, said that Fatima is a part of me. Whoever hurts her hurts me, and whoever hurts the Holy Prophet hurts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tragedy of Fatima was that she was attacked. Man aghadabaha, Rasulullah goes straight to that point that he knows that later on there were individuals going to come that they will annoy, oppress, anger Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. The tragedy of Fatima was and remains that we do not know the date of her martyrdom nor do we know the whereabouts of her grave. كانت الأدلة تتراكم عندي بشكل كبير لكن في حاجز نفسي من الانتقال إلى أن سمعت هذه الخطبة المباركة. الحمد لله على ما أنعم وله الشكر على ما ألهم وعشت معها تماما كأني حقيقة كأني كنت أقف في مسجد رسول الله حقيقة. In recent weeks, I decided to investigate this further by having a closer look at the events surrounding the martyrdom of Lady Fatima. while focusing on the sermon of Fedek, which always stood out to me in the Majalis. Who is Fatima? Who is this noble lady that Rasulullah, her father, says Fidaha Abuha? Join me on my journey as I meet different researchers and scholars to investigate this period in history. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد بوي by Allah the son of Abi Quhafa dressed himself with the caliphate 
and he knew most certainly that my position in relation to it was the position of the axis in relation to the handmill. The flood water flows down to me and the birds cannot fly up to me. So I decided to place a curtain between myself and the caliphate and detach myself away from it. I began to wonder whether I should assault or to calmly endure the blinding darkness of tribulation wherein the grown men become feeble and the young grow old and the true believer acts under strain until he meets his Lord. So I decided to go for endurance and I adopted patience even though there was a pricking in the eye and a suffocation in the throat, I saw my inheritance plundered in front of me until he passed away and he passed it on to Ibn al-Khattab. They shared its others strictly amongst themselves. Where was Imam Ali السلام, when Fatima al-Zahra was struck? What did Imam Ali السلام, do about the strike on the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi? Many ask the question, especially when it comes to the discussion of the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra السلام, Because when we hear the details or we hear the lectures that are given in relation to the martyrdom of the Lady of Light, this particular part of the story is one that sometimes confuses people. That if Imam Ali is seen as one of the bravest personalities, if not the bravest personality in the history of the religion of Islam, known for his bravery on the battlefield, then where was he to defend his wife? Many ask this question because even for us in our daily lives, if we were to see a lady, for example, oppressed in front of us, we would straight away stand up to try and help her. We would try our hardest to be there for her, especially if she is attacked by people in front of our own eyes. If that lady is related to us, there seems to be more importance, of course, attached because this is a member of your household, and therefore if she's a member of your household, then you'd expect that that member of your household would be someone that you'd stand up for. At the end of the day, they are your own flesh and blood. They are the dearest to you and the nearest to you. And therefore you'd expect that you'd be there for them. People ask this question that it seems when we hear the narration about Imam Ali alayhi salam, when we hear that narration about Imam Ali alayhi salam, we wonder that why did Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam allow people to strike his wife in front of him? Why did he do nothing about it? This is the man who's fought Amr ibn Widd al-Amri and the man who's fought Marhab and the man who's fought many famous warriors on the plains of Khandaq and the plains of Khaybar. And yet when his wife is in a very difficult moment, you find that there are people who will say that where was the brave lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where was that famous Dhul Fiqar that we are all so proud of when we read his biography? Yet when it comes to the martyrdom of his wife, you don't hear much about the bravery and you don't see much of Dhul Fiqar at all. This question therefore is a question of the utmost importance. A question which is asked by young and old. Shia and non-Shia, as in there are non-Shia who mock the Shia by saying that you believe in this concocted story that Fatima al-Zahra salam was struck between the door and the wall. Where's Imam Ali salam? You keep raising the status of Imam Ali and all your majalis and yet the Imam Ali that you admire is nowhere to be seen. Then you find even amongst the Shia, there is a minority amongst the Shia who will say that I cannot believe that my Mawla would not have done anything to protect his wife. If they attacked his wife and they pushed the door on his wife, then my Mawla would have been the first to stand up. And if you who are giving Majalis 
are not mentioning anything about a stand from him, then this raises doubts for us. And sometimes you cannot blame someone. At the end of the day, if you are raised believing that the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Imam Ali alayhi salam, and then you read the story, you may not sometimes express it, but deep down you'd be thinking that why wouldn't he do anything? Why wouldn't he stand up? Imam Ali alayhi salam fought at Hunayn and destroyed the opposition. If it wasn't for him on the day of Hunayn, on the day of Khandaq, on the day of Khaybar, on the day of Badr, the Muslims would have been destroyed. So why then, on this particular incident, do we find little mention? It portrays Imam Ali alayhi salam from this moment until possibly when he becomes the fourth Khalifa. It portrays him as a passive person, a person who seemingly is not willing to rise in the most difficult moment. And you'll therefore find that even some of his own Shia will use this incident to say that, look at Imam Ali alayhi salam. He highlighted to us that although something happened to Fatima, for the greater good of the Muslim Ummah, he did not do anything about it. How many times do you hear this? That we should learn from Imam Ali alayhi salam, that Imam Ali could have easily attacked those who attacked Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. But because he never, then we should also learn from this and not make Fatimiyah a big deal. Today you find that there are people who really are at a crossroads in their understanding of whether we should discuss Fatimiyah openly or no. Because there are some who now are trying to really tell us that you shouldn't speak out openly about what happened to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam or what happened to Imam Ali alayhi salam because you should look at the greater impact it has on the Muslim Ummah. So in other words, this could head towards a direction where we scrap these majalis completely, where we scrap all the books that have been written on Fatimiyah because the reality is there'll be a day when our kids are confused. If I'm not going to answer these issues, these questions, then our children will grow up without an identity of understanding the position of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam or the position of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So therefore, this question is one that requires a thorough examination. Did Imam Ali alayhi salam stand up for the rights of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? If he did, how did he? If he didn't, then what could be the reasons? Let's examine this and I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, how important is the will left behind by the Prophet to Imam Ali alayhi salam in highlighting to the Imam what he is going to face and how he should react to what he sees in front of him? Number two, did Imam Ali follow this will to its fullest? And how did he show that if he had more supporters, he would have definitely risen against the ruling authority of the time? Number three, how many of his companions blatantly spoke out against the caliph of the time? And which famous personalities did not walk away and hide, but rather stood up and made it clear exactly what they thought of those who usurped the rights of Imam Ali alayhi salam? Number four, how did a famous member, if not the biggest member of Bani Umayyah, tell Imam Ali, I'll help you, let's get your leadership back. And why did Imam Ali alayhi salam reject his offer of help? Number five, how did Imam Ali alayhi salam highlight that he did not want the Muslim community to be destroyed because of this issue? But number six, if this is going to be used as an excuse for us not to discuss Fatimiyya, how then shouldn't we discuss other things that also happened in relation to the Imams after Imam Ali alayhi salam. Number seven, when the attack happened on the door, this attack, did Imam Ali alayhi salam do anything about it? If he did, what did he do? And what did he say? And how did he make sure that he followed the will of his father-in-law? Number eight, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, did he ever see a lady in front of him get attacked and he did nothing but say, be patient, O lady? And why does nobody ever say to the Prophet, why did you just stay there and watch? But they seem to all blame Imam Ali alayhi salam without knowing the finer details. Furthermore, after that, how did Imam Ali alayhi salam make clear that everyone goes through a test of their patience? And how did the sermon of Shakshaqiyah in Nahj al Balagh highlight that for all those who say that Imam Ali alayhi salam did not speak out for the sake of Muslim unity, how does one sermon make clear 
There's a moment you need to speak out against wretchedness, wickedness, deviation, and unsteadiness. And how on a night like this does he find it difficult to see the loss of his most beloved? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Ask many in the Shia world, what was the will that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family left behind for Imam Ali, alayhi salam? Because we know a will could be divided into two. You could either have a will where you leave behind, for example, what possessions you want to be shared out in terms of someone to execute, for example, one third of your belongings from the whole portion. Or you could have a will of advice. I could, for example, to my son or to my daughter, say to them, for example, that I'm leaving behind, let's say, a turban. I'm leaving behind a tasbih, a sibha. I'm leaving behind a few rings. I'm leaving behind this property, that property. This should be given as an endowment. A type of will I might ask an executor to ensure that they execute and it's distributed. That was done by the Prophet to Imam Ali alayhi salam. For example, a basic thing like the turban, who it should be given to, who should execute the burial rites, where to be buried and so on and so forth. But the will of advice was fundamental. Because in the will of advice, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, opens up to Imam Ali alayhi salam about what's going to happen when the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, dies. What's going to happen straight after the Prophet dies. This is part of the knowledge of the unseen or the knowledge of future events given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet then in turn tells Imam Ali alayhi salam, he makes it clear to him, O oh Ali, the Quraysh will certainly rise against you. Makes it clear. O oh Ali, the Quraysh will rise against you. And they will unite in their oppression and their humiliation of you. Look at these important points. O oh Ali, the Quraysh will rise against you. And they will unite in their oppression and humiliation of you. So what do they have? We have oppression, we have humiliation, and we have a rise against the Imam. Their humiliation is going to take place. There's gonna be a moment you're gonna be humiliated. It could be that your own daughter is forcibly married to somebody, it could happen. There will be oppression against you. There will be people rising against you. So what should you do? If you have enough numbers, then fight them. But if you don't, then restrain your hand and safeguard your blood. This will is of the utmost importance because the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, is making it clear to the Imam what's going to happen shortly. There is a group who will unite in oppressing you, in humiliating you, in rising against you. This will be the Quraysh and the partisans of the Quraysh. You have two options. If you want, you can try and fight them back. Look around you, see how many supporters you have. I don't want you being passive. That's not your character to be passive. You are the one, Khaybar, Khandaq, Badr, Uhud, as well as Hunayn, nobody could come near you. But you have to look around you. Are the loyal supporters there? Use those supporters. If those loyal supporters are not there, then what should you do? Then restrain your hand. Because I know it's going to be tempting for you to use your hand. Restrain your hand. Safeguard your honor and your blood. This will which the Prophet gives to Imam Ali alayhi salam is the most fundamental piece of advice in relation to the incident of the door. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, is telling him, all of these that you see who claim to be our friends, they're going to rise against you and they will unite upon your oppression and your humiliation. Be ready for it. Don't think that those around us are all friends of ours. In Sahih Muslim, there is a hadith clear as day. Twelve of my sahaba are munafiqs. Twelve of my companions are munafiq, are hypocrites. Because you know, sometimes you're given this bit of information where people say to you that everybody around the Prophet, you have to believe in the ultimate decency of them. In Sahih Muslim, you can type online the hadith of the 12th 
hypocrites of the companions. It's a clear hadith. And Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul is always blamed as the one who all these hadiths about hypocrisy always blame this one person, nobody else. Ibn Ubay, Ibn Ubay. Okay, no problem. Around, do we admit that there's 12 according to Muslim? Okay, let's go with this 12. Do we admit there's a surah even called Munafiqun? Okay, so Surah Al Munafiqun has no restriction. There's a whole chapter of the Quran called the hypocrites. Do we believe? Both Shia and non-Shia. When the Prophet comes to the pool, he sees his companions going one way and he's going the other and he says, where are they going? And he is told, you do not know what they did after you. Bring all of these together. Bring the will of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. The Prophet tells Imam Ali, the Quraysh will unite against you and they will rise and they will seek to oppress and humiliate and this oppression and humiliation in itself requires a dissection because i believe the humiliation would go to an extent where if imam ali alayhi salam realizes he doesn't have enough numbers and the prophet has said to him restrain your hand then it could even lead, dare I say, to a daughter of Imam Ali being forced to marry someone Imam does not want her to marry. That's how far the patience was going to be tested. That's how far the oppression went. So then Imam Ali alayhi salam takes this will on board. Me and you, if we took a will like this, I guarantee you, even if we were told restrain your hand, we wouldn't. But there's a difference between someone who's an imam chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and us. Therefore, when Saqifah happened, people asked that where was Imam Ali? Why did Imam Ali not rise for his leadership? Of course he did. Imam Ali alayhi salam, 360 of his companions came to him. They said to him, Mawla, have you heard about what's happened at Saqifah? That Umar and Abu Ubaidah have pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr. He said, yes. They said, Mawla, we are ready to sacrifice our life for you. You advise us, what do you want us to do? He said, you are ready to sacrifice? They said, yes. He said, you know Ahjar al-Zayd? It was an area there. They said, yes. He said, I want all of you to meet me there tomorrow morning. You know, sometimes you witness these scenes where somebody is chosen, for example, by a Roman emperor, and he's told that you're going to be the leader after me. And then suddenly that Roman emperor's son comes to take the leadership. And he tries to get rid of that gladiator. And they make sure that they get rid of the wife of that gladiator as well. So here what happened was Imam Ali knew that there's a problem here in Medina. And he knew that the Holy Prophet told him, they're going to rise and unite against you. They're going to seek to oppress you and humiliate you. If you have enough numbers, fight them. But if you don't restrain your hand, point number one, let me see how many of you are loyal to me. You meet me tomorrow morning, Hajar al Zayd, but there's a condition upon meeting me. What's the condition? All of your heads must be shaved. You shave all your heads. You have long hair, you have short hair, you shave your heads tomorrow, you meet me there in the morning. Those 360, I guarantee you, amongst them were some very good companions. But the moment that you have to put out the truth or stand for the truth, knowing that it could bring you difficulty, there's only a few people who will be there. The reality is when the people have to say something that is truthful, but they know their life is in danger, many will shy away. Many want the comfortable life. Why do I need to speak something controversial? Why do I need to speak the haq and defend Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? It's better that we sugarcoat what our beliefs are. It's better that we talk about other things. So here what you have was Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at these companions and I guarantee you that some of us, if we were amongst those 360 lovers of Imam Ali alayhi salam, we could have gone home and someone at home could have told us, where do you think you're going? Say, oh, I'm going to meet Ali ibn Abi Talib at Fajr because we're going to fight for our... No, you're not meeting anyone for Fajr. You stay home and you stay with me for Fajr. You can pray at home, you can fast at home, you can love Ali ibn Abi Talib, but you don't go to where he's asked you to go. It could happen. There are some of us at the moment when you want to stand for the truth, you look at the world that surrounds you and you're like, is it worth losing all of this comfort? Not at all. There's no need to stand. How many of them were there that morning with their heads fully shaved? You found Abu Dhar al-Ghifari came. Miqdad came. Salman came. Ammar came. 
Hudayf al-Yaman came. Five of them came. Imam Ali was there. The five of them were there. Imam Ali alayhi salam looked towards those five. You can imagine the scene. What I'm narrating to you, I want to picture one day, inshallah, we're able to actually see this vividly in all honesty. And we see this moment where in the darkness of the morning, just before the sun rises, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam waiting and seeing Salman and Abu Dhar and Miqdad and Ammar and Hudayfa, he sees them. And then the famous statement is made. This statement, we've heard different numbers, where he says that if I had 50 or if I had 40, I would fight for what's mine. How many? Even if there was 40 or 50. You think Ali ibn Abi Talib has a problem fighting people if he has 40 with him? I guarantee you, Imam Amir al-Mu'min if he wanted to, he could have eight people with him and he can finish off the whole opposition. We saw it at Hunayn. At Hunayn we know there were thousands in front of him. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, when did you ever question his bravery before this day? For you to dare to question his bravery and his judgment on this day. But Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam looked at that situation and he said, if I had 40 or if I had 50, I would fight those who have usurped my power, my authority, that which is my inheritance. But I don't. So now I have to endure calmly. I have to have endurance through the blinding darkness of tribulation. You all know which khutbah I'm quoting from. I'm going to come to it later on because there are too many people who say Imam Ali alayhi salam for the sake of unity did not want to mention these things. Okay, we'll come to Shaq Shaqiyah very shortly and we'll show how much Imam Ali alayhi salam did not want to speak out. So what happened was five now, from those five, those five were the hardcore loyal ones. Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, Ammar, Hudayfa. A couple of days later, after Saqifa, there was about 11, 12 who couldn't resist. That they felt that they had let down Imam. And they wanted to come out and say, you know what, it's not happening. There's no way. We were not there that morning. But we're not just going to sit at home like that. They went to the mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they saw the first Khalifa giving a khutbah and they stood up. Of those 12, we've already mentioned Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, Ammar, we've mentioned. Another of the names that's mentioned is Buraid. Then we have another six who are mentioned. Khuzayma bin Thabit. They call him the Shahadatain. You have Uthman, the son of Hunayf. Sahal, the son of Hunayf. Ubay, the son of Ka'ab. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, Ibn al-Tayyahan. These six came and they said, get yourself away from this leadership. This doesn't belong to you. This belongs to Amir al mumineen They stood up and they stood up because they realized we can either sit back or we make it clear to everybody as a hujjah on them. That do not come on the day of judgment and say you were scared. We know that we could be, this is the exact words they were using, casting ourselves into perdition. By standing against the status quo, there were thousands who hated Ali ibn Abi Talib in Medina. Thousands. Ali ibn Abi Talib on his sword, he had blood of the fathers of people in that area. They couldn't wait for the day they could take out their vengeance on him. So when Khuzayma bin Thabit, Ubay bin Ka'ab, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, Uthman bin Hunayf, Sahal bin Hunayf, Ibn al-Tayyahan, Salman, Ammar, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, and Buraid, and all of these, when they came, they stood up and they said, we are all loyal to one man, nobody else. That man is our leader. Abu Bakr, at that moment, was shaken by what was being said. Omar at this moment takes him away, get away from here. There's going to be something bigger of an uproar. Who else found out? Look at the supporters of Imam Ali alayhi salam who did not remain silent. Because this impression is given that Imam Ali alayhi salam lost his leadership and his supporters were just quiet. The supporters came out of them. A man who lost his life savagely because of his loyalty to Imam Ali at that moment. Malik bin Nuwayra. All of you know the story of Malik. Malik bin Nuwayra, companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, comes into Medina, asks what's happened. They say that the leadership has gone to Abu Bakr. He said the rightful leader is Ali. What's the man from Ben Utaym doing leading? He spoke out. The moment he left, Khalid ibn al-Walid told Abu Bakr, that guy is going to be a danger for us. Leave me, leave him to me. And you all know what they did to him. 
You all know what they did. As much as you try and sugarcoat what Khalid ibn al-Walid done to Malik bin Nuwayra in 2020, a few days away from 21, in 2020, until today the books talk. Khalid and Malik. Khalid and the execution of Malik. Why? Because Malik was an apostate. Apostate because of his loyalty to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's an apostate because of his loyalty. And because he rejects the Khalifa of his time, it seems, as the poet says, ride a camel and you're still called the mother of believers. But in that moment, you are not treacherous to the caliph of your time. But when Malik opens his mouth, then he's accused of being the king of treachery. Isn't that true? Malik, the only thing he did was he rejected the Khalifa of his time. Tell me, where is it written? That if I reject the authority of someone chosen at an election, that I'm to be executed. Why am I to be executed? Unless you believe that that Khalafa from Saqifa is divine. And you said that divine authority ended with Nubuwa. So now is Khalafa the same as our concept of Imama? Because if he rejects the Khalafa of Saqifa and you kill him, you've made your Khalafa become Imama. And even Imama, you don't execute someone who rejects you. Otherwise, Ali ibn Abi Talib could have executed many after Jamal and Safin. So what do you find? Malik bin Nuwayra executed because of his loyalty to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Not just executed, you know what they did with him. They beheaded him, they used his head. They used his head as the board for when you cook. You know, you need, oh, obviously if you get like a, a hot pan or a pot, you need something to put it on. Isn't it? As a human, you need something to put a, a, a pot on. So what better than to put it on a head, a decapitated head? What better? The problem is, when you say these things, and you see what happened in Syria, and you see what happened in Iraq, where the people were being beheaded, and you place them on the ground, and you cook food on top of them, if you try and link it, it becomes uproar in the world. Uproar, if you try and link it. This is Islamic history. I'm not taking something out from my pocket. I'm not taking something out. There are companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who objected to what Khalid did to Malik. And you see the defense, the defense that emerges. But then again, everyone is entitled to believe in their narrative. If you believe that, for example, Khalid is not masoom, he made a big mistake. Okay, I accept that, but don't stop me from talking about it. So for me, what do I find? Imam Ali alayhi salam. People who questioned his bravery. He has a will from the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. The will says to him, they will rise and unite against you. They'll try to oppress you, humiliate you. If you have enough numbers, rise and fight them. If you don't, restrain your hand. Do you know how difficult it is for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, to restrain a hand that's undefeated? I don't think any of us will appreciate. And that's why Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam says nobody was as oppressed as Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Because Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen knew that I could right now raise my dhul fiqar. Nobody here would come near me. But my Prophet has instructed me that if you cannot have those numbers, then you're going to have to safeguard your blood. You're going to have to safeguard your honor as well. But you're going to have to do it by restraining your hand. How do you balance that? Virtually impossible to balance, especially if it becomes a difficult situation. Someone says, but this is leadership. Shouldn't Ali ibn Abi Talib have fought more? Let me make something very clear here. The leadership of Saqifa to Ali ibn Abi Talib is worth less than the sneezing of a goat. A goat? I don't know if anyone, have you ever seen a goat sneeze? I've never seen it, so it can't be that, it can't be worth that much. But let's say that if a goat sneezes, Imam Ali said, that's worth more. That's worth more. This goat sneezing is worth more to me than Saqifa. Why? I'm chosen on the day of Ghadir. What difference does it make? Saqifa is your loss, not mine. The Prophet said, Imam Ali is like the Kaaba. You go to him, he doesn't come to you. Salman came to you, Abu Dhar came, Miqdad came, Ammar came. Doesn't matter who got elected president in the election. We voted for someone else, he's still our president.
That president can be leader. That doesn't mean that he's my president. It's important for us to realize many people assume that Imam Ali السلام, should have done more for his leadership at Saqifa. His leadership was already with him at Saqifa. He was already leader appointed by Allah, not by seven, eight people. There's a difference when the Lord of the heavens chooses you rather than a group of Ansar and some Muhajirun. So what happened was on the one hand, Imam Ali السلام, is already the leader. On the other hand, truthfully, Imam Ali السلام, witnessed that there isn't enough support. What I did to these people's fathers at Badr and Hunayn has come back to haunt me. This is the reality. Who came and told him that, listen, I'll help you, Abu Sufyan. Now, if ever you saw opportunist number one, Abu Sufyan. Why? Abu Sufyan smells that, you know what, there's a chance to destroy Islam here. Muhammad's hard work is being finished within a couple of days. Some of his companions can't stand the others. Their real characters are all coming out. And the son of Abu Talib, of all of them, they've neglected. This is the best day of our life. Abu Sufyan comes to Imam Ali, he goes, I've got soldiers waiting. Soldiers, you give me the green light and we'll go and finish who we want to finish. What people don't realize is, again, Imam Ali is already leader. You're trying to offer me something. Sneezing of a goat is worth more. And that's it. Sneezing of a goat, that is what I value. What you're trying to offer me, you think that this is a massive moment for you. Ghadir, I'm chosen already. The books of history will be the only ones that write. I'm the only person after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi who has some proofs about him being chosen by people as number four and some which mention him being chosen by God as number one. No other person will ever have that honor of combining one and four. People's choice and the Lord's choice. You'll never find anyone who has that honor. So you, Abu Sufyan, you think I trust you? You fought the Prophet in the revelation of the Quran. You think I'm going to trust you in the, when it comes to the interpretation of the future of this religion? You're just looking for an opportunity to destroy this religion. Therefore, when those who come and say Imam Ali السلام, did not say anything against the Caliphs because of his concern and his cooperation, no, on the contrary, it was Abu Sufyan who tries to get in and Imam Ali realizes, keep Abu Sufyan away from all of this because he'll destroy it even more. Let's play it cleverly. In which way? We'll play it cleverly in making sure those who are my Shia are able to refer to me. They want to pray behind me. They can come and pray behind me. And those who want to go over there, they can go towards that direction. Remember the story of Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam when there were two ladies who came with a baby and one said, that's my baby. And another said, that's my baby. Nabi Sulaiman said, okay, very well. We'll cut the baby in half. I'll give half a baby to you, half a baby to you. One of them said, no, 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 it's hers. Nabi Sulaiman gave the baby to the one who just said that. She said, no, 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 it's hers. He said, take the baby. She said, but I'm saying it's hers. He said, no, it's yours. Why? He said, because of the reason being that you as a mother would not be able to witness your own child being cut in half. Likewise with him, he couldn't bear to see the religion of Islam cut in half in front of him. Imam Ali السلام, at that moment knew that the religion could easily be cut into pieces by Abu Sufyan. So at that moment, Imam Ali السلام, decided that at that moment, what should we do? At that moment, we restrain our hand. Whatever I'm going to face now, oppression, humiliation, I'm going to see all of them unite against me, the numbers are not there. I'll restrain my hand and try and be as strong as I can in this moment. And that's why they were waiting. How do we get the pledge from him? How do we get the pledge? Because people assume that they only came to the house of Fatima once, attacked, crushed, and so on. No, three times they came. On the third time was the attack. First couple of times they came, tried to get a pledge of allegiance. Many of you were with me when we dissected the hadith which said, Omar said, I'm threatening to burn the house. I heard an argument of someone recently that Omar said, I'm threatening to burn the house on them, on Ali and Zubair. Therefore, he wasn't threatening to burn Fatima. He was threatening to burn Imam Ali. 
You Shia say that he was threatening to burn Fatima? No. He was threatening to burn Imam Ali. So it's okay. He threatens to burn Imam Ali. It's fine. You accept that? You as a Muslim accept that? Anyway, first time, threaten. Qunfud comes back. No listening. Second time, they're not listening. When Boraida comes back from the expedition with Osama, he tells Bani Aslam, 80 of them, that we will not pledge allegiance except to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, there is an uproar in Medina because Bani Aslam are saying that our pledge is to Ali, only to Ali. This new caliphate is thinking there's still a problem. We're not settling in because there's still some sort of uproar where there is a group who are saying we will only pledge to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Now they know, Omar knows, it has to happen now or never. This is the moment. Fatima is going around to every single house. While she's going to each house, what's she doing? She's going to every single house telling people, come back, change your mind. Have you forgotten what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi advised you? 40 days in a row, Fatima al-Zahra would knock at the doors of the Ansar and the Muhajirun. Come back, am I not the daughter of Rasulullah? How could you accept that the rights of Amir al-Mu'mineen are usurped? For 40 days, she wouldn't stop. 40, 45 days after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has died and the expedition of Usama have all returned back to Medina and some of them are blatantly siding with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Now they make the statement that now or never we go towards the house. You find that even amongst our own Shia, there are some who say, yeah, but you know what? There's no real report about them kicking Fatima to Zahra or attacking Fatima to Zahra or slapping. They say that, you know what? It's only Kitab Sulaim bin Qais. There's nothing else which is to be mentioned. I can name you a number of different references from our own sources. And I can even show you non-Shi'i sources that say that the Shia from as early as Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam that the Shia from as early as Imam al-Sadiq were already believing that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam was slapped, was attacked and so on. In terms of our books, a person can go to the work, the Fawaid of Karajaki, an early source, you can go there and you can see the narration about the attack on the door. In terms of non-Shia books, that talk of the Shia believing early on about the miscarriage of Muhsin or Muhassin and the slap and the attack on Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. There is a book I remember reading of a scholar. It's an early text. A scholar by the name of Al-Malti Shafi'i. Al-Malti Shafi'i. Here's a book, if I remember the name rightly, at tanbih wa Rad. And in this, he discusses Hisham ibn al-Hakam, companion of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Within that discussion of Hisham ibn al-Hakam, when he talks about Hisham, he says, Hisham ibn al-Hakam, he is of the Rawafid, and he is of those who believe in the attack by the leadership on Fatima, the slapping of Fatima, and the breaking of the rib of Fatima. This is not a Shi'i text, but look in the time of Imam al-Sadiq how he discusses how a companion of Imam al-Sadiq was known for the following beliefs. One of them, so how early are we talking? Imam al-Sadiq was born 69 years after Fatima al-Zahra died. Hisham ibn al-Hakam is a companion of Imam al-Sadiq. He writes that Hisham ibn al-Hakam is of the Rawafid and part of the Rafidi belief is that they believe that Fatima al-Zahra's rib was broken. So what have I given you? Not only am I talking of a Shi'i source that discusses, not Kitab Sulaim bin Qais only, other Shi'i sources, not only does Shaykh Tusi mention within the Talkhis that part of our belief there is no doubt about is the broken rib of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, but also that Al-Malti Shafi'i himself mentions that Hisham ibn al-Hakam used to believe in this thing. Hisham was in the time of Imam al-Sadr Therefore, it's not something that our Shia only changed our minds on later on. Early on, the Imams and their companions all believed in this. Umar ibn al-Khattab, 
Qunfud, there's clearly a problem in Medina. And when they come towards the house again, Fatima Zahra has already a number of times. Now someone says, why is Fatima Zahra answering? Fatima Zahra is not answering. When someone gathers firewood outside your house, you're going to try and put a hujjah on them. That what are you doing? Someone said that there is no door. I can show you many ahadith. I think Khaybar was a door. But I can show you many other ahadith where you've got, for example, one guy peeking through a door in Medina upon hearing the death of Ja'far al-Tayyar. You've got Ibn Abbas talking about how the, uh, his door of his house was violently shaken when he and Umar wanted to discuss who the verses of Tahrim were revealed about which two wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Further than that, you tell me Fatima Zahra, let's say she went to answer a door, like she went literally to open the door and say, welcome for a cup of coffee, please join us. Let's say she did that. I can show you references where wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi used to answer a door while he was in the house. So is there a door? There's some doors which are big doors. There's a door which was her door, which the Prophet would come and say, close all the doors except the door of Fatima and Ali. Was there, for example, evidence that other ladies had answered doors? Yes, there was. But on this occasion, it wasn't about answering a door. A man comes and says, I'm going to burn this house. And we will attack it. And Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam now puts the hujjah on the man. This is the house of the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The man at that moment smashes the door down onto Fatima. Someone asks, where is Imam Ali? Oh, Imam Ali was there. He's definitely there. What did he do? Oh, he grabbed the man by the neck straight away and placed him on the ground. And said to him, were it not for the will of my prophet, all of you I'd finish off. All of you. Do you know how difficult it is to restrain your hand at that moment? Oh, son of Sohak, you try and threaten me. He's grabbed him by his neck, placed him on the ground. And who else was there? Others. Khalid ibn Walid is there. Muhira ibn Shabbat. There's hundreds even outside. It's a full force attack. Do you think that full force attack scares Ali ibn Abi Talib? Not one bit. Not one bit. Do you think that Imam Ali ibn Talib did not fight them because of his uh, fear for the unity of Islam? <laughs> unity of Islam at that moment? Let's come to Shakshaqiyah shortly and talk about unity. He placed them on the ground and they're all looking. And who, Which one of you wants to come? Come on. Come on. At that moment, the will of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa crosses his mind again. And he recognizes that if we go on a bit further, there's blood everywhere. And he makes that point clear. I'll discuss it tomorrow night about the burial of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. When she dies, the will is over. So now it's in his hands. And he makes clear that I'll be looking for blood very soon. But I'll come to that tomorrow. The problem is, when you give majalis, let me be clear in making a point over here. When you give majalis, a lot of those under the mimbar have not read the finer parts of Shi'i history. Therefore, they come with a worldview without having read the finer parts. Because you know what some say? Imam Ali alayhi salam, look how much he loves Fatima Zahra, but he did not use Fatima Zahra to break the Muslim Ummah's unity. So therefore, we shouldn't speak about Fatima al-Zahra because Imam Ali himself didn't mention it for the sake of the Muslim unity. Why do you then attack Muawiyah in your majalis or Shia? Did not Imam Ali's son make a sulh with him? If your criteria for the sake of Muslim unity is that if an Imam makes peace with the leadership therefore do not mention anything bad about the leadership then why are your majalis full of attacks on Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan let go for the sake of Muslims let it go Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam did not use Karbala for the sake of Muslim unity. So why do you have majalis for Karbala? Imam Zain al-Abdin didn't keep talking about Karbala. Someone says, but he gave a khutbah in Sham. Imam Ali gave a khutbah called Shakshaqiyah. Why do you conveniently forget it? 
You see, that khutbah shakshaqiyah is when Imam Ali made it clear, never, ever accuse me of remaining passive or silent about the wickedness and deviation that took place after the Prophet died. Every Shi'i on earth I'm going to say this now. I'll take it to my grave. Whoever wants to listen to me can listen. And Ayatollah Al-Mar'ashi Najafi, may Allah bless his soul. In one of the stories he narrates about Imam Al-Hujjah, he says, Imam Al-Hujjah, when, of course, he didn't know it was him until he had left him, he said, he told me, memorize Shakshaqiyya. Every Shi'i household, every Shi'i, whether your parents teach you or you don't, you should teach yourself Shakshaqiyya. You should memorize Shakshaqiyya. Because Shakshaqiyya is the moment Imam Ali السلام, turns around and says, don't accuse me of being silent. Don't accuse me that I forgot what happened after the Prophet died. Be, beware, by Allah, the son of Abi Quhafa dressed himself with the Khilafah, with the Caliphate. And he knew that my position in relation to it was the position of the axis in relation to the hand mill. The flood water flows down from me and the birds cannot fly up to me. I put a curtain against the caliphate and detach myself away from it. So I began to think, should I assault? Or should I endure calmly the blinding darkness of tribulation? That's the Islam you're proud of? Should I assault or should I endure the blinding darkness of tribulation wherein grown men become feeble, young become old and the true believer acts under strain until they meet Allah. So I decided to endure and I adopted patience even though there was a pricking in the eye and suffocation in the throat. Imam Ali did not mention Fatimiyya. What do you think the lines of Shakshaqiyya are? A human has one small thing stuck in their eye. Wallah, they'll make the whole household go crazy. I can't see. I, can you get me water? Oh, please, my, get me hot water. I can't see. A small thing. Imam says, I had a pricking in the eye because of this. And my throat was suffocated. I saw my inheritance plundered in front of me. And then when he passed away, he gives it to Ibn al-Khattab. And they shared its others strictly amongst themselves. Why don't you mention these lines about Imam Ali from Nahj al-Balagh sermon 3? Why? Why do you conveniently pick and choose what Imam Ali you want? I myself have given majalis, alhamdulillah, with tawfiq, biographies, and majalis of, on Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. I don't pick and choose Ali ibn Abi Talib. At the moment, what I see in Shi'ism is people picking Ali ibn Abi Talib and choosing. Oh, our Imam would never ever speak out like this for the sake of Muslim unity. Have you read the biography of Yahya, the son of Umm Tawil? You who come and tell us that you know what, we shouldn't speak out openly. Yahya, the son of Umm Tawil. Ask many of the Shia. Who's Yahya, son of Umm Tawil? Who is he? Imam Zain al Abidin's companion, outspoken. Hisham ibn al Hakan, Mu'min al Taq, companion of Imam al Sadiq, outspoken. Mu'min al Taq was reprimanded by Imam al Sadiq. Yahya ibn Umm Tawil was reprimanded by. Stop making it out that our imams and their companions were all passive. Our imams and their companions, there were moments they observe a will or advice from someone higher than them. And sometimes they speak out against injustice. Now with the way we are heading, honestly, with the way that we are heading, soon no more Fatimiyya Majalis. Because people are saying that, you know what, if you talk about Fatimiyya, then you're going to attack Muslim unity and it's going to finish Muslim. So let's stop Fatimiyya Majalis. No more Fatimiyya Majalis. No more books on Fatimiyya. There are authors who have books about how Fatima Zahra died who are now saying, don't talk about Fatimiyya. I'm not understanding. It's like telling a kid at school, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. When the kid talks about outside school, why are you talking about it? Okay, Baba, stop teaching it then. You can't have Fatimiyya Majalis the whole year 
And then when the Shia want to talk about it, you're like, but don't talk about it. Okay, so why are we being brought up in our madrasa system? Being told Fatima al-Zahra went through this, Fatima al-Zahra went through that. And then when we want to talk about it, don't talk about it. So what, shall we scrap Fatima here? Because the way we're heading a Shia, our identity, is now everything's going to be hidden. Why? Why? Why can we not give our narrative? Other schools in Islam can give theirs. They can agree to disagree with us. They can agree to agree with us. But people should be allowed to give their narrative. Therefore, Imam Ali alayhi salam in Shakshaqiyya, do you know what he said? The religion became a religion of deviation after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died. Imam Ali, why are you breaking the unity of Muslims? Why are you mentioning these lines? Religion of wretchedness, wickedness, deviation. That's where Islam went. Where's Imam Ali's unity? Or do you conveniently forget Shakshaqiyya? So therefore, did Imam Ali السلام, stand up? He did. He held the throat, the neck, placed the person on the ground. He said, but the will of Rasulullah says, let's go. We have to have a pledge from Ali. Even, do you know how they got the pledge? Someone put his hand on his hand. That's it, that's a pledge. And we know in Islam, there's no such thing as a forced pledge. A person has to give it willingly. Otherwise, the pledge is not even accepted. But you see, that extent they went to, they went to that extent where they were ready to burn a house, fire everywhere outside that house, imagine. And in the midst of all of this, the daughter of Rasulullah lying on the ground, bleeding. And you think that the blood from that broken rib stopped her? She got up, Hassan and Hussein, come with me, let's go. You do this to my husband, to my imam, I'm not stopping. Imagine having a rib that's been pierced by a nail and still standing up. You want to know strength? A female giving birth is strength. A female pregnant and attacked and standing is strength. But to her, her everything was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Everything for her. And she took Imam al Hassan. She took Imam said, while bleeding. And she got attacked again, slapped on the eye as well. Not just the pierced rib, but a slap on the eye. The very eyes that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi used to look at. The eyes that Zainab used to see. And in that womb was Muhsin alayhi salam. And that injury, she only lived for a few days after that injury. She lived for a few days after that injury. It wasn't a long time that she stayed alive. Some people make it seem like she stayed alive for months. No, it's just a few days afterwards from that nail piercing the rib. She was in her house. She knew that it was her final moments. For Imam Ali alayhi salam, he knew that it could be the final time that he sees Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. She had come to him. She said to him, she looked towards him. She said, it seems like my death is coming near so she looked towards him and she said to him with my death approaching now and my death coming near I have a wasiyah for you what's my wasiyah said that the wasiyah that I have is that number one marry my niece Amama I have a niece by the name of Amama I want you to marry her Okay, because I don't want these orphans to be left alone. How old is Imam al-Hassan? Eight. Imam al-Hussein? Seven. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. Five years of age. Um Kulthum, one and a half years of age. Marry my niece, Umama, after I died. That's number one. Number two, those who usurped your right and those who attacked me, I don't want them anywhere near my funeral. Because you know, in those final days, they try to come and say salam to her, ask for forgiveness. She says, I don't want them near my funeral at all. All. Fatima al-Zahra, why don't you stand up for unity, Fatima al-Zahra? Why don't you let them come just for the sake of uniting the ummah? No, they do not come near. Their salam I do not reply to. And the hadith is clear that Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr until the moment that she passed away. Then further than that, place me in like a beard, like a coffin, so nobody sees the shape of my body. Hijab in my lifetime, hijab even in my death. Make sure that that covers me as well. She mentioned all of them. Have I ever been a bad wife? 
to you? Have I ever been difficult with you? She tried to open up to him in every single way possible. She looked around at him. He knew these could be the final days. That to Maghrib and Isha period on a night like this was the last time he had gone towards the mosque. Who was around her? Bibi Fadda alayhi salam was around her. Who else was around her? You had Asma bint Umais was around her. She had mentioned to them that look I'm going to go towards my room. I'm going to perform the ablution. I'm going to be reading some Quran. Read out the Lord call out to me. When you do call out to me I want you to see if I answer then you'll know I'm alive. If I'm not answering then you'll know that I've returned back towards my Lord. They went on further by saying what? They went on further by making clear. She said to them when Hassan and Hussein return back home make sure that you're able to give them the food for them. That moment she went towards her room and Fadda looked towards her knowing that this would be the last time that she'd see her. She went towards her room, performed her ablution and begun the recital of the Quran. Attached to the Quran from the beginning of her life all the way until the end. The narration mentions that all of a sudden there was a silence in the room. Asma bint Umais and Fadda alayhim salam both knew that this could be the last moment. All of a sudden they entered upon the room. They called out, O oh daughter of Rasulullah, reply to us. O oh daughter, O oh daughter of the man who ascended the heavens, reply back to us. O oh greatest of the ladies, call back to us. At that moment they realized that Fatima, Fatima had returned back to her Lord. One of the most difficult moments was this for Fidda alayhi salam. But I ask you how many moments did Fidda have to remain patient with? When Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein returned back to the house, and that moment Bibi Fidda said to them, do you want me to prepare your food? And they said to her, Fidda, 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 when have you known us to eat without our mother Fatima being alongside us? When they came towards the body of their mother Fatima Zahra, Imam Al Hussein came towards the chest of his mom. Imam Al Hussein, with the tears flowing from his eyes, knew that his mother had returned back to her Lord. But who did they want to inform? They wanted to inform the man for whom Fatima was everything. In his life. Uh, where was Imam Ali? Imam Ali was in the mosque in Medina. And they went towards the Imam. They came towards the Imam. They said to him, Mola, Father. He said to them, Tell me. And they said to him, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Our mother Fatima has returned back to her Lord. Imagine the stature of Imam Ali, how brave he is. What do they say? They say the Imam fainted at that moment. The Imam Imam realized that he never would he look at the eyes of his wife again. He came towards the body of his wife and the tears were flowing from his eyes. A flower came from heaven, went back to heaven and left her fragrance in my mind. That night when they had to perform the ghusl of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen was performing the ghusl. Asma bin Umais was looking at him perform the ghusl. He began to wash that holy body. All of a sudden he left the body and he went to sit in the corner of the room. Why? He placed his head between his knees. And Asma says, I saw Amir al-Mu'mineen cry in a way like I 
have never seen him cry before. The man who lifted the gate of Khaybar, why would he cry in this way in front of me? She said to him, Mola, what is it? Tell me, why have you broken down like this? He said to her, Asma, Asma, don't blame me. Don't blame me as I was washing. My hand came across the rib of the lady most beloved to me. That broken rib had broken him down. Who would have ever thought something could break Ali ibn Abi Talib down? I ask you how deep the piercing was that the Imam was broken when he felt that area. They had to now come and collect the body. They wanted to take the janaza now. They wanted to lead her towards the burial. Abu Dhar al Ghafari says, he says, I saw Imam al Hussein alayhi salam come on the top of the body of his mother Fatima and call out, Mother, mother, talk to me. Mother, it's me, Hussein, reply back to me. All of a sudden, Abu Dhar says, he said, I saw Imam Ali remove Hussein from the body of his mother, from the chest of his mother. I said to Mola, why did you do that? For what reason? He said, oh Abu Dhar, at that moment Jibra'il came towards me. He said to me, remove Hussein from the chest of his mom. The angels could not bear to see Abu Abdullah crying in that way. The angels could not bear to see Imam Al Hussein on the chest of his mother. I leave you with this line. If the angels couldn't bear to see Hussein on the chest of his mom, then how in Karbala did they bear to see Shimmer on the chest of Hussein? <laughs> إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون واللعنة الدائم على القوم الظالمين يا الله raise us with أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام provide us the intercession of فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام إن شاء الله tomorrow night we'll continue with the majlis of the burial of the body of the holy lady we pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and honor of all those who are feeling unwell who face difficulties with COVID at this moment a very good friend of ours faces such a difficulty another friend of ours a family friend their eight-year-old son is going through major surgery there are many others out there who have asked for our dua let's all raise our hands bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim amma yujibu al-muftar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su' أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 يا الله إن النيم فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام أنسى all of our حاجات يا الله يا الله allow us to visit جنة البقيع allow us to go to the grave one day allow us to see the grave of فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام we pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the سورة الفاتحة but before it with the loudest of your salawat, let's welcome our respected Mullah Ali Fadl.
Tonight from every eye tears of blood for you fall Tonight from every eye tears of blood for you fall Every eye sees you crushed between the door and wall. Weeps for the sides I the moon, the stars and all. And with them from a wounded heart, your name we call. And with them from a wounded heart, your name we call. Zahra, ya, ya Zahra. Zahra, ya Zahra, ya. Fire to the house that angels visit is brought. They tell him she's inside and he shouts out, so what? They tell him she's inside and he shouts out, so what? With the blood of Zahra, the pledge of Ali sought between the door and nail, heaven sent is caught. Zahra, ya, ya Zahra. Zahra, ya Zahra, ya. Crush the rose that brought joy to eyes of Muhammad. Ripped its petals that flow in tears. That is Aisha. His unborn grandson, Mohsin, to the nail is led, and on his daughter the feet of oppressors tread, and on his daughter. The feet of oppressors tread Zahra, ya Zahra Zahra, ya Zahra Bleeding from her chest to Mohsin she bids goodbye Bleeding from her chest to Mohsin She bids goodbye In the depths of my heart a child You'll always lie I'll see you, uh, youth, not an unborn in my eye, and to your grave daily I'll sing a lullaby. A Zahra, a 
يا زهرة زهرة يا زهرة علي بري زهرة It's broken And the lion cries A child Left an orphan His hand feels the rib in her chest It is broken and the lion cries a child left an orphan A Zahra, yeah, a Zahra Zahra, yeah, Zahra عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بذكرى استشهاد سيدة نساء العالمين مولاتنا الزهراء سلام الله عليها نسأل الله تعالى بحق مولاتنا الزهراء أن يعجل في فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان ويقضي حوائجنا وإياكم ويشافي ويعافي جميع المرضى نقرأ بعض الأبيات في رثاء مولاتنا الزهراء وإن شاء الله الحوائج مقضية ببركة الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على يا زهرة قال سليم قلت يا سلمان هل دخلوا ولم يكن استئذان فقال اي وعزتي الجبار وما على الزهراء من خمار لكنها يا لاذت وراء الباب رعاية للستر والحجاب فمذ رأوها يا عصروها يا عصري كادت بنفسي أن تموت حسرا نادت أيا فضة أسنديني فقد وربي أسقطوا جنيني 
فأسقطت بنت الهدى يا وحزنا جنين هذاك المسمى محسنا أتضرم النار بباب دارها وآية النور على منارها وبابها باب نبي الرحمة وباب أبواب نجاة الأمة بل بابها باب العلي الأعلى فثم وجه الله قد تجلى فاكتسبوا بالنار غير العار ومن ورائه عذاب النار ما أجهل القوم فإن النار لا تطفئ نور الله جل وعلا فاحمرت العين وعين المعرفة تذرف بالدمع على تلك الصفة ولا يزيل حمرة العين سوى بيض السيوف يوم ينشر اللواء وللسياط رنة صداها في مسمع الدهر فما أشجاها والأثر الباقي كمثل الدملج في عضد الزهراء أقوى الحجج ومن سوى متنها سود الفضا يا ساعد الله الإمام المرتضى ووكز نعل السيف في جنبيها أتى بكل ما أتى عليها ولست أدري خبر المسمار سل صدرها خزانة أسرار وفي جبين المجد ما يدمي الحشاء وهل لهم إخفاء الأمر قيد فشاء أويلي أويلي على الكسرة وضلعها والله ضلعها او يد ما يجري دمعها لعدارها الظالم تبعها ورا الباب تحكي من سمعها توجع على الباب او دفعها ونبت البسمار بضلعها ونبت البسماء هاي هاي عارف ظليع هاي ما زالت سيدتي فاطمة الزهراء روحي فداها بعد أبيها رسول الله معصبة الرأس ناحلة الجسم مكسورة الظيل منهدة الروك مسودة الميت محمرة العين يخشى عليها ساعة بعد ساعة يا عيني ابكي ودمعك خل يهل دم على الزهرة وضلعها اللي تهشى والله تهشى مقبعت بالهضيمة خلاف ابوها أو حتى من البكع ليهم نعوه تعنى ودارها وبيها عصروه لما انطق الظلع منها وتهشم هيا هيا لما انطق الظلع منها هيا 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 
تهيشم يا نصايب انا ضلع ليش بالبسمار يا نصايب وعلي الحزن واجب دور يا نصاب يا نصاب لو انظمي على الايام يا نصاب مثل سود الليالي غدت هي 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 مثل سود الليالي غدت هي 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 بيت الدعاء لقضاء الحوائج وشفاء المرضى حملاي يا علي علي الرجز شن اليوم حملاي فجعني وما حد من القوم والله حما الي حملاي كسر ضلع وسقط على القاع حملا يا يو على داري غدت نار سرية هي 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 وعلى داري غدت نار هي 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 سرية بيتين لقضاء الحوائج وشفاء المرضى إن شاء الله مقضية الحوائج ويشافي ويعافي جميع المرضى في جميع بقاع الارض. تواسيني وين ما تكون قاعد باي مكان انت ومكانك تواسي الزهراء وتلطم صدرك. يا حي قولي مقلتي تهمي الدموع على من ري يضرب منها ظلوعه ما ظلومه امي الحسن ما ظلومه امي الحسن ما ظلومه يا زهراء امي الحسن يا زهراء امي الحسن يا ريض ظلو عفاطمة جهارا ويدخل بي تها حطبا ونارا عجيب تولي من إذا شهد المغارا يا فير ويوه حرق البيت الرفيع يا ما ظلوم أمي الحسن ما ظلوم يا زهراء أمروتك يا سيدتي أي ما ظلوم ما يظلم ايه يا زهراء يا فاطمة البتول وما ين اوصى بنحلته الرسول أيا يغصبها يا ولا أحد يقول أيا يغصبها يا ولا أحد يقول أسأت ببعضعتي الهادي صنيعة ما ظلوم أم الحسن أم الحسن إيه ما ظلوم تقضي حوائجكم إن شاء الله أي لقد حكموا بليل أو نهاري 
بكاها لا تقر بلا قرار فكيف قرايا رها والحكم جاري عليها ويلم تطق الهجوع يا مظلوم أم الحسن مظلوم أي مظلوم أم الحسن أي لقد هجموا عليها وهي حسرا وقادوا باع لها بالحبل قهرا وألقوا حيم لها بغضا وكفرا قضيت وفؤادها يضحى مروعا مظلوم أم الحسن مظلوم نظرة يا مولاتي يا فاطمة الزهراء مظلوم اي مظلوم اي فمذ قادوا عليا بالنجاد عدت من خلفه والحزن بادي الا خل ابن عمي او انادي أو أكشف للدعاء رأسين وجيعا فما ليت فما لت دونها فغدا عليها بضرب منه سود من كبيها وأودع حمرتين في مقلتيها وقرطاها بهن تثريت جميعا يا, 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 يا ريت يا ابويا القوم بعدك علي يا ريت يا ريت ودمعتي مثل جرح الصدور يا ريت يا ريت يا من وصيتهم بالبضع والله يا ريت تجي تشوف شجرة منهم علي يا يا تجي تشوف شجرة منهم علي إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون لقضاء الحوائج وشفاء المرضى نقرأ الآية المباركة ثلاث مرات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله إلهي نقسم عليك بظل الزهراء عجل لوليك الفرج يا الله إلهي بظلع الزهراء اقضي حوائجنا يا الله إلهي بشرف الزهراء 
عافي وشافي جميع المرضى يا الله ارزقنا في الدنيا زيارة الحسين وفي الآخرة شفاعة الحسين ثبتنا على ولاية أمير المؤمنين يا الله تقبل منا ومن مؤسس هذا المجلس بأحسن قبولك وإلى رواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما خدمة الحسين نهدي للجميع ثواب المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات I'm trying to ask my parents about this stuff. Bro, do I look like a scholar to you? That stuff that I don't even know about. <laughs> Where were you? Hey, I just came. Why are you so lit? Oh, go on. Guys, the thug and her home again. Yeah, man. Guys, I came across this thing called I've come SOS. No it's way. an IHTV, yeah. You can go on your WhatsApp, type any question you want about your name on it. That's mad, is it? Wait, wait, wait. You're trying to tell me I can ask any question without mentioning my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't need to feel embarrassed when I have a question to ask. Nah, don't worry. Go on WhatsApp, type your questions in about your name. What time does the show start? It's 6.30 p.m. I'm doing it. I'm going to watch it. Amaris, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Live, yeah? Yes, Facebook. Stream's ready. Stream's ready. Mm -hmm. Zayd Maxson, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, get ready. We're going to go live. Okay, we're going to play intro. Playing intro, you got five. Going live. Four, three, two, one. Cue. Cue. That night when the child was lost and the mother soon followed. I was there that night when uh, when ribs cracked like a vase broken and the flower inside bled red, bruises swollen. I was there that night when her heavenly scent painted the door and the wall, a flower giving its fragrance even